Good afternoon and a warm welcome to the parliamentarians and staff who've joined us from many countries to be part of our second week of the African Parliamentarians Forum. We all hope that you got um, lots of useful things out of the first week and that you started networking with each other and sharing tips or experiences with each other through your small group discussions last week. Please be in touch with me or our other staff if there's anything we can do to help you and your colleagues make the most of this peer learning and experience sharing endeavor um, and to make the most of the networking opportunities that we can offer um, to support you here. My name once again is Dr. Catherine Lena Kelly and I'm the Associate Professor of Justice and Rule of Law here at the Africa Center and I'm the faculty lead for this program. So in just in this capacity, I'll spend just a few minutes summarizing um, what we discussed last week before turning to our panel for this week. So just briefly, a couple of uh, key things that came up last week that are worth remembering as we move forward. First, the quality of parliamentary oversight of the security sector is a function of three factors that we started discussing last week and we'll continue to discuss throughout the program. In English, they're known as the three A's. Um, ability, authority, and attitude. And so ability uh, is referring to whether legislators have the resources and the capacity to conduct oversight. Authority, of course, is about whether legislators have the legal mandate and sufficiently detailed standing orders to conduct their oversight. And attitude relates to whether legislators have motivation and incentives to conduct oversight. So in the discussion group that I led last week, for example, I know that some of you discussed that there could actually be additional A's or other factors that we could add to this list. Some people suggested adaptability as a key factor and acumen um, as, as useful additions. We also discussed how members of parliament can use their institutional vantage points, not only to approve or modify defense and security budgets, oversee uh, deployments, review procurements, but also to shape defense and security policy into something that can advance the security interests of citizens themselves. And as members of parliament turn over um, and, and move across different committees or move in and out of office, um, and those with relevant technical expertise on security and defense leave office or move on to other endeavors committee-wise, uh, many of you talked about how attention must be paid on an institutional level to helping new MPs acquire relevant skills and experience that can help them fulfill these roles that we're talking about here. Parliamentary oversight, of course, also transcends the national level in Africa. We have participants um, who've shared um, about their work who come from regional parliamentary bodies like the ECOWAS Parliament, uh, the SADC Parliamentary Forum, and others. And so these regional parliaments also may offer opportunities to engage in oversight on the regional level, um, to help um, train uh, members of parliament and their staff in a cross-country way to share knowledge and tools and practices for effective oversight. And parliamentary oversight of the defense and security sector also plays a fundamental role in facilitating democratic and civilian security sector governance, as some of you pointed out and discussed. And as a core institution of security sector governance, parliaments have opportunities to work with and call on other oversight bodies like ombudsmen, supreme audit institutions, independent anti-corruption and human rights commissions to help ensure that democratic and civilian control. And I think as we move forward this week and in the following weeks, we will hear a bit more about how some of these institutions fit together um, uh, as well. And then finally, budget analysis and processes, secrecy issues, constituency relations, um, the role of political party loyalties in facilitating or hindering the conduct of oversight. These were all themes that you all brought up in the discussion groups um, that you said you're hoping to exchange further on. And we hope to help you do that in a useful way here in plenary and in uh, future discussion groups. In particular, we heard that there are opposition and ruling party roles to play in oversight of defense and security. Sometimes, for example, opposition figures lead public accounts committees um, or the work there and have some key opportunities there to shape oversight. And as um, a committee president from alternatively the majority party or coalition, it can be a balancing act to be responsive to the head of state, other members of the committee and the populace. But we also see that even under these challenging conditions, um, whether you're from the ruling, uh, the incumbent side or the opposition side, the legislature can still play an important role 
in overseeing how security resources are spent, um, which is a useful service to the executive. Um, so we hope to keep using the forum and these exchanges to help you all connect with each other so that you can share as much as possible about your own lessons learned and your own insights about how to approach some of these issues on oversight, accountability, and constituency outreach. With that, we'll turn to the panel that we have uh, scheduled for you today. I'm pleased to be the moderator of this second panel of the Parliamentary Forum entitled Oversight, Overseeing Defense and Security Budgets. I will now be joined on the dais by Dr. Willene Johnson and Mr. Neil Cole. And this plenary panel has the following objectives. We're hoping to analyze approaches and tools that parliamentarians have to oversee defense and security budgets and how those tools apply throughout the budget cycle. We hope to discuss how parliaments can and should deal with secret and classified information that's relevant to budgetary oversight. And we will highlight the role played by budgeting in the realization of national security objectives and the delivery of security and justice to citizens. So with that, let me introduce our distinguished panelists who've joined us today. First, we have Dr. Willene Johnson. She is a consultant advising institutions, national governments, and international organizations on issues related to finance and development. Uh, to that end, she's facilitated workshops for practitioners engaged in strategic planning and budgeting, as well as in peacekeeping and economic reconstruction. Dr. Johnson was previously the US Executive Director at the African Development Bank. She was a member of the UN Committee for Development Policy, co-chair of the African Regional Committee of the Grameen Foundation, and chair of the Sub-Saharan Africa Advisory Committee of the US Export-Import Bank. Um, her work on Africa benefits from her global experience with economies and finance gained from 20 years in the Federal Reserve System, where her assignments included research and operational responsibilities in foreign exchange and inter international financial markets. Mr. Neil Cole is also joining us today. He is the Executive Secretary of the Collaborative Africa Budget Reform Initiative, or CABRI, and this is an intergovernmental organization that provides a platform for peer learning and exchange for about 30 different African ministries of finance and planning. Cabri's work covers fiscal and budget policy, budget transparency and accountability, and public debt management. In addition to his role at Cabri, Mr. Cole has been co-faculty member of the Harvard Public Finance Management Executive Training Course, and in 2016, he was invited to be a co-faculty member of the Harvard Ministerial Leadership Forum. He's also a part-time faculty member of the International Training Center of the International Labor Organization. Um, interestingly, between 2001 and 2013, he worked for the National Treasury of South Africa in senior management positions in the Budget Office and International Economic Policy Divisions as well. So welcome to both of our distinguished panelists. We're delighted to have you with us today. And I think we'll go straight into um, the questions that I have for you as the moderator. Um, we'll start with Dr. Johnson. So um, could you spend six or seven minutes giving us an overview um, based on your wealth of experience in public finance? Um, what are the different stages of a standard budget cycle? And can you explain how the security sector fits into that cycle, um, articulating the oversight roles of parliament in that cycle, please? Well, thank you very much, Dr. Kelly. And I, I'd like to thank the Africa Center for organizing this program, but I have a special word of thanks to you for asking me to speak on International Women's Day, since I feel uh, that the role of women throughout the world um, is increasing and that when we actually are able to do what we know how to do that the whole world will be better off and uh, we will certainly have better peace and security. Uh, what I'd like to focus on today are issues related to oversight. Now we understand that parliamentary oversight goes well beyond budgets and includes assuring that the security services obey the rule of law, 
and that all operations are consistent with national law and international treaties. But today I would like to focus very much on the role of parliament in overseeing the formulation and execution of the national budget. This involves the planning, uh, it involves controls, and most importantly, it involves being sure that the budget is executed in a way that efficient, efficiently and effectively meets the national objectives. In other words, the budget must support the national strategies, uh, the overall strategies, but in particular, the security sector budget must support the national security strategies. In fulfilling their role, legislators call upon the services of many others inside and outside of government. Elected uh, parliamentarians play a lead role in oversight and are org organized into committees. And the committee structure is particularly key in the area of um, budgetary oversight. Uh, I was pleased to hear that you had such rich discussions last week and mentioned the role of opposition parties or political parties. Uh, one understanding that has come out of recent studies of uh, parliaments and their role in oversight is that often the parliaments and the parliamentarians themselves will tell you that they feel that they lack capacity. And in this, when they say that, they are at times discussing their own knowledge of the field of security, but very often they are lamenting the lack of staff. In some cases, there may be only one or two staff members who are allocated to deal with these issues. And so what we will discuss as we go along is how do you bring in other assistance and how do you effectively uh, enhance your capabilities at a very broad national and as you mentioned, regional levels. Um, what we've come to understand is that the committee staffs play an important role but that there are also independent legislative research centers, um, think tanks at universities and other budget advocacy groups that provide technical evidence needed to support the decisions that the parliamentarians are making. Oh, I believe this is, this is the one, I'm sorry. I think this is the only one we have. All right. Yeah. Uh, well, that's fine. Let me then uh, give you an introduction to the, the other slide, which is was very straightforward. And the, um, the one that we're not looking at uh, looks at the entire budget cycle and makes clear that the legislator has a well-defined role at each stage in the cycle. And you can actually see these stages uh, that are produced in front of you there. What you will understand is that, um, and, and I think that perhaps Mr. Cole will go into this because in the paper that he's produced on Kenya, they actually give you the dates, but you can see that actually stage one starts before the actual, the beginning of the, of the budget year and is a period of planning. Uh, during that stage, the drafting takes place and it involves uh, the critical process of strategic planning. And strategic planning obviously uh, examines what the priorities of the country are, yet at the same time, it must be realistic 
and understand that the resources of the country are limited. And so the strategic planning um, hopefully is an inclusive process where the parliament is holding hearings, uh, interacting with constituents and members of civil society and building a consensus on the national objectives and priorities. Uh, the role of the parliament then is to be sure that the budget reflects these priorities that have been built uh, in the national strategy. And as you can see, the security sector is always set within the overall budget. Um, many of us have spent years talking about transparency and accountability. And I think we understand those concepts very clearly, but we're now coming to grips with uh, our understanding that contestability and comprehensiveness are probably just as important. All four of these are principles of financial management. And in the book that Dr. Kelly has given you, The uh, Securing Development, you will see all of those, uh, the details of all of those principles. But the principle of comprehensiveness means that all government activities need to be included in the national budget. And so we are focusing on the security sector in the middle, but in effect, every single sector and every program of the government must be included in the overall planning. And the events of the last week have underscored that importance. Um, as you know, in Europe, the European Union has a growth and stability pact that sets guidelines for individual country deficits and debt. And only yesterday in the Financial Times, uh, the Dutch Minister of Finance warned her colleagues within the European Union uh, about ideas that were floating around about taking the defense spending out of the government budgets. Um, and many countries said we have these unexpected expenditures related to the war in Ukraine. Um, we don't want that to be uh, included in our budgets and the, and the guidelines for national security. As a result though, um, the, the Dutch minister warned that if that happened, uh, there would be very poor risk management and countries might end up in a situation where they did not have um, the ability to sustain the payments on their debts and to have an orderly growth that would go with the overall objectives of the countries. So she warned that moving items off the book was a very dangerous approach. And as we go along, we'll see that one important guideline that parliamentarians uh, should see embedded in the actual budget act is one that allows countries to respond to unexpected shocks shocks that have economics as well as social consequences. Now there are different structures in different countries. In some cases, there will be a contingency fund. In some cases, there will be a system for administrative transfer from one budget unit to another called a virement. But others will have a supplementary budget. And because most of the countries have moved on to a multi-year planning framework, they will have a framework to respond to the course of those shocks over a period of time. So 
the events that we're seeing in Europe remind us that these struggles that you're facing are actually ones that have been experienced in every region of the world and must be dealt with effectively in every country and every sub-regional group if we are to uh, achieve the objectives of both growth and security. Dr. Willeen. Um, may I ask, um, I think in, in the interest of time, um, because I want to ask you several different questions, um, should we keep this slide up right now of the budget cycle? Um, I'm wondering if you could finish walking us through um, how the security sector fits into that cycle. And then um, I have two more questions for you um, about some of the things that you're mentioning, um, you know, uh, discrepancies between the security sector budgets and actual expenditures. We'll come back to that, certainly. Mm -hmm and then the legal authority that parliaments have. Um, but does it make sense for us to keep this other slide up right now? We can take it Yes, down. it does, because actually, okay. um, as you go through the, the questions, um, I think we'll begin to see that each stage in that cycle represents an important part of the process and also represents the interaction of different actors. And that will, if you keep that up as we walk through, we can point out where different actors are more important in, in that process. So in the Excellent. first process, we've talked about planning and strategy and the importance of the inclusive process involving the public, rep, the representative role of Congress, because Congress, of course, uh, or Parliament has many roles. But yes, if you proceed with your questions, let's... Uh, Look at okay. this as we go along. Excellent. Um, well, um, we're a little bit over time with this first one, but do you have anything to add on this question one on the different stages of the standard budget cycle, which we see here in English? There are links to the slides in French from the chat. Um, and I think you've started us off um, with uh, certain parts of this cycle, but um, maybe in another two minutes or so, if there are other things to highlight here, um, we'll finish that one and then we can move on to the other two questions. I think that it's important to note that um, you were talking about authority and that the budget law actually gives authority both for revenue connection, uh, collection and expenditure. Uh, and there will be the issue of um, how much authority a country has and how important those other two factors, attitude and ability might be in exercising authority. But let's move on to your questions. And I think that we can bring uh, this out as we go along. Excellent, okay. Um, well, my second question for you um, in relation to the security sector budget cycle and parliamentary involvement and is it, and it is, can you explain a bit more the legal authority that parliaments have to be involved in oversight, but also how their oversight fits into this broader system of checks and balances for security sector resource management. So um, how are parliaments relating to inspectors, auditors, ombuds people, um, et cetera? I think it is important to step back and talk about the relationships, but I'd step back one step further in that we are uh, talking about countries that are moving towards democracy. I think the experience in my own country has shown that there is never any point when you have it. You always are struggling to improve your processes and the way you run the government so that you can achieve that democratic ideal. And one of the uh, importance has been the, the separation of power, the judiciary, the uh, executive and the parliament. In this case, we're focusing very much uh, on the power between the parliament and the executive. And there's a very interesting study that was just published a few months ago um, by Transparency International. It's called the Global Defense uh, Integrity Index. And it looked at countries and they studied 86 countries and they found that only a handful of those countries, four countries actually, lacked 
formal authority. Yet the great majority of the countries, almost 80%, were not able to have uh, truly effective parliamentary oversight. So it wasn't authority that was missing. Um, it was, in fact, that the ability and um, attitude came into play, but let's be frank, it is also that either the military or the government uh, was working very hard to be sure that parliament was not able to fulfill its role. So the question is, how can we balance the power um, so that the parliament has the authority that it needs? So let's look at this in the framework of, of the government and move very quickly uh, through each part. If you look um, at, go to now to the budget preparation and resource allocation, you understand that there are different uh, setups in terms of whether it's the Westminster parliamentary model or the judicial Napoleonic model. In the Napoleonic model, the, the budgetary, the, the Supreme Audit Authority has almost a judicial uh, function. And in the other model, it is more to assure the um, financial integrity, integrity and also efficiency. Uh, the IMF has been overseeing many uh, fiscal reform efforts and, and now the World Bank is uh, joining with the UN in looking at security sector reform efforts. What we've seen is that those efforts now are bringing us closer to uh, a system where the ministries themselves have responsibility for internal and external audit. And we're also seeing uh, that there are more open budgeting systems where external actors such as uh, the universities or budget advocacy groups like International Budget Partnership uh, are able to play a role. And in this way, by having this broader uh, information and input from others, uh, you're able to expand the capability of uh, the, the parliamentary staff in this area. But despite these efforts, um, this remains perhaps one of the most challenging roles that that government can have. And particularly challenging in the security sector. Um, you, you mentioned the whole, uh, the challenge of how do you deal with government with secrecy? And um, I yes, wonder- Yes, that's my next question for you. Yes. Oh, okay, please uh -huh. go ahead. Uh, okay. Great. Um, so um, I, I think uh, my next question for you um, that I'd like you to spend maybe six or seven minutes on um, is about um, using examples if you could discuss the potential for these discrepancies between security sector budgets and actual expenditures, as well as these challenges you've alluded to already associated with secrecy and off budget revenues and expenditures. So we're curious, um, as you're discussing here, um, the different pieces of the cycle also what lessons can be learned about how to strengthen parliamentary oversight when we have these issues of secrecy um so i don't know i um we can finish um uh your answer here on the legal authorities if you would like and then move into the the, the secrecy question as well um but there will be a little bit of time for you to address that just one all right that. i i think it's important to um let let me pay some expense there's this this issue of secrecy is is what I guess you'd say kind of the elephant in the room. It's um, one thing that makes it seem so challenging to actually have an open budgeting process for the security sector. Um, I spent more than twenty years at the central bank, and it is only after I heard of. Uh, what was going on in other parts, even of my own government, that I came to understand how well developed our process of secrecy was. Um, 
uh, I worked in international. And uh, so the process of handling confidential information was very important because sometimes it wasn't just our confidential information, but information of partners, other countries that we worked with closely. And the first and most important thing is recruitment. I have to say that um, human resources underscores everything that goes on. And some parliaments do have the responsibility of, of approving senior appointments. And that needs to be viewed as a, whole, as a part of this entire process. Um, so vetting is the first thing. They actually um, will review your accounts, your family's accounts, understanding all the assets that you hold. Um, and from the time you get responsibility, uh, that includes handling secret information, there's monitoring of your, um, of your accounts. And that's to be against, to protect against corruption, that, that I'm not receiving funds in order to give someone else a, a, a particular company a contract. But there also are handling procedures, confidential, uh, depending on the level of confidential, confidentiality, material is in two envelopes. There are special carriers that will take it from one office to another. And perhaps most important, there are very special storage requirements in locked cabinets. But one thing that we always did at the Federal Reserve is that we never allowed um, the use of non-government computers for government work. Nor when we were at work, were we allowed to do any personal business or to visit uh, certain, the certain websites would be blocked and even certain types of messages couldn't come through. So it is comprehensive. It involves uh, training, but once done, it allows the uh, parliament to discuss these security issues and be assured that they will not be discussing anything that would put the government operations at risk because those things have been clearly marked and they understand how to use that. But you were asking about the relations with others and that comes out at each step. So in, uh, in step two, what we've seen now is that the, um, the ministries, ministries are preparing the budget and they are mobilizing uh, to allocate the resources. They have to have clear strategies. And most importantly, they have to be able to move to three, which is the budget execution. And underneath that will be um, substantial reform of the way that business has been done with all too many accounts, hard to keep track of. Um, many countries now are moving uh, at the local level and even towards the a national level towards this single treasury account, an idea that all the money is in one pot and uh, the uh, ability to take it out must be clearly authorized. Um, and then the oversight and reporting uh, will be done, but oversight and performance evaluation as you move on have been helped tremendously by the academic research, work in think tanks uh, that has been going on, and also the investigative reporting that has um, let the parliament know the impact of the program. Excellent. Well, um, well, thank you, Willene. I'm going to um, just summarize sort of what's on this slide. I know our, Frank, our French speaking uh, participants are following along on a slide that's not displayed, but that we've provided in a link in the chat. Um, but we see stage one here, um, setting the macro fiscal objectives. You took us through that. That's part of the broad budget cycle, but then these blue arrows are how the security sector fits in. Yes. Um, and so we've got you know, national security strategies to which this should match or sort of advance 
Um, you walked us through that um, from soup to nuts with stage two, budget preparation and resource allocation. Um, and we spent quite a bit of time on that, um, discussing these issues of secrecy and off, off budget expenditure as well, sort of as we're talking about preparation, but also budget execution, which is step number three um, here in the cycle. Um, and um, your discussions of, you know, approval of different um, personnel appointments and things like that came into the discussion here. Step four is oversight and reporting. Um, so you've walked us briefly through that. And step five, performance evaluation, um, very skillfully relating for us um, how other institutions of oversight fit in here with what the parliament is also supposed to be doing, um, particularly in the domain of security and defense. Um, so um, with that, I think we can take down the slide for the moment. Yes, I think so. Okay. and. Um, yeah, we have about maybe two minutes left before I'll turn to Neil. Do you have any final words for us on any of these three questions, Willie, in the budget cycle and parliamentary roles, legal authorities and other actors, or um, security sector budgets, um, actual uh, expenditures and off-budget issues? I would just like to call attention to uh, two or three cases. And uh, I'm not going to... Uh, to delve deeply into cases because I know that uh, Mr. Cole will be doing that. But um, in the Securing Development uh, book, there are two cases that I found of interest. Uh, one was the experience of the Central African Republic back in 2008, although it's a few years ago, I think there are important lessons learned. Um, just briefly, and you can read the book for more detail, you find that um, the Central African Republic was bringing in more than a million dollars. This is in 2008, 1.1 million, uh, at a time when the entire defense budget was uh, about 16 million. They brought in funds from the sale of S escort or guard services to private companies and international organization, from fines um, issued by the gendarmerie, and from an airport security tax. Uh, they brought in that uh, more than a million dollars, but it's not clear where it went. There were guidelines as to which ministries it should have gone to uh, and how it should be managed. And so what we missed was the opportunity to be sure that those funds coming in met the overall uh, defense objectives. There's another and perhaps even um, more tragic story that relates to Mali in 2013 and the budget request for force provision and support. Um, Mali's government had enormous needs for new equipment and for maintenance. Um, but as it stood, the request had to go through a central finance and equipment directive requests for maintenance had to be cleared. And um, the process was so slow that the military actually suffered in terms of their training exercises and in terms of operations. And so what we saw then in the end was a military that was ill-equipped to meet the challenge that it had to face. Um, and finally, there's a, a not exactly a government case, but it, it came to me in a letter from the International Budget Partnership. They described a situation in Senegal where um, the government had uh, impressed everyone with its ability to disperse uh, uh, three months of provisions to more than a million uh, families. Yet what they found was that, and it wasn't the government that found it, it was the public said, but none of this is going to people with disabilities. And it was the International Budget Partnership that raised the call. Social media, TV, and radio took it up. Eventually the government despond, responded and eventually the ministry would change its criteria for distribution to be sure that it met the needs of the most vulnerable. I hope that parliaments will go the next step and be sure that in addition to the gender sensitive budgeting, which many of them are doing, that they have a system of evaluation that looks at the most vulnerable uh, in 
especially in security and catastrophe, and be sure that they're included. So I think that we are learning from the lessons of the past, but um, the results of that Transparency International study point out how challenging it is and how ability, attitude, um, uh, uh, ability, attitude, and authority are complexly interconnected and we have to yeah. improve all at the same time. Absolutely. Well, this is a great way to um, end uh, your our portion, my, this portion of my discussion with you, Dr. Willeen. Thank you for those examples. I think those will really be fruitful for um, question and answer. I know that there are folks on the line who wanna ask questions. After um, my conversation with Neil, we'll open it up and you can ask questions of both speakers. So with uh, Mr. Cole, um, the Collaborative Africa Budget Reform Initiative, um, as I mentioned earlier, works with ministries of finance, budget, and planning to investigate what works and what doesn't and under what circumstances. So in about six minutes, could you discuss just a few of the key lessons you've learned about the budget and oversight process that might be relevant for our members of parliament and staffers in the audience? Thank you very much, um, Catherine, and um, thank you for inviting me back for the second time. Um, it's, it's good to be here with you and also with um, everyone online. Um, so when I think about um, the budgets of the security sector um, and the experience that, that, that we've had in examining the budgets of the security sector, whether it is um, being presented as a, as a bid for additional funding or to justify um, an increase in, 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 in spending, um, as well as um, you know, the exercise of, of oversight, it can, be, it can be quite overwhelming um, because some of the items are quite different. And yes, I mean, there is the expected um, confidentiality or secrecy um, that that needs to be that needs to be applied, and I I always think of this um, story um, that the first democratic finance minister shared with us, the finance minister that was appointed by Nelson Mandela, when he met the first democratically elected and appointed defense minister that was also appointed by Nelson Mandela. And the reason for this particular meeting was that they, they needed to find um, savings in the budget, or they needed to find funds in the budget to support all these new post-apartheid programs. So if you think of the land reform program, it's a completely new program um, for which previous years had not um, um, budgeted for. So the finance minister goes off with his delegation to meet the defense minister. And they obviously have the moments of, uh, you know, greeting each other in a comradely fashion. Um, and the minister of finance then gets down to the purpose of his, of his visit. And it says, well, I mean, you know, you're my, you're my comrade. You understand that there are new constitutional imperatives for the new democracy, but we need to find the money for that. And we think that we may be able to find some of this money in the defense budget. Um, and um, the Minister of Defense turns to his officers and he says, you know, please help the Minister of Finance. And um, the door opens and somebody, um, rolls in this gurney um, that is filled with just stacks and stacks and stacks of dot matrix papers with lots of items and lots of numbers and budget lines. And, um, and the defense minister says, um, you know, you're welcome to go through this and, and find the savings. Um, Obviously, this overwhelmed the finance minister, and I'm sure if all of this was thrown at a parliamentarian, um, who you know would never have the same 
number of staff as the finance minister, it would also be quite quite over quite overwhelming. Um, luckily, the minister of finance had a staff member that said in his delegation that said, "Don't worry, minister. Um, we know what's in 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 and among all those um, you know um, lines of, of of expenditure, and 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 we'll we'll be able to give you." a good sense of where the savings are. Um, but I think that, um, you know, story um, points to um, a, a couple of things. Um, and, and certainly what, what I've picked up in my experience of working um, in the budget office and where um, all spending ministries needed to come and present their case um, to justify their budgets and also present their case for additional resources and where decisions need to be taken regarding savings. Um, the security sector was not one that we exempted from, from, from that. And I think that's an important lesson also in the way that, in the way that oversight is exercised. Because oversight is, is important, right? Um, I mean, if we think of the purpose that oversight needs to achieve, then it is about ensuring that financial resources have led to service delivery and actual results. And the security sector is not exempt from, from that. Um, public, the way that public funds have to be used, they have to be used within the rules. Um, and, the, and there are rules that pertain to the way that public funds are used um, and they also rules that pertain to the way that funds are used within the security sector where a degree of secrecy has to be has to be applied and and the last one in terms of the objectives that we are trying to achieve with oversight um, and one sees parliaments playing an increasing role here, and that is to ensure that value for money has been achieved, right? Um, and, 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 and I emphasize again that um, the security sector is not, is not immune from being um, tested in terms of value for money, because all that we really want to ensure with value for money is, you know, has, have purchases been made in the most economical way? And with the, the number of purchases that's made by, let's say, a defense department, the issue of economy is, is, is very important. And then there's efficiency, um, because sometimes with the same budgets, with the same allocations, you need to be looking for the efficiency gains um, to test whether more can be achieved with the same amount of, of resources. And then obviously effectiveness is, is, also, is also an important one. The, the equity one, I think is important for, for, for Africa in, in particular, because equity is, is, is a value for money measure um, that has a couple of things that it is trying to achieve. Firstly, it is looking at is there a role in the security sector, especially in the defense department um, that, that can support um, pro-poor budgets or pro-poor objectives, right? Um, I mean, can, can defense departments be seen as opportunities for skills development, opportunities for employment, et cetera, especially amongst, especially amongst what is Africa's dividend, and that is our young um, population. Um, but the equity measure is also about the trade-offs that need to be made between what is often equally important priorities um, and the trade-offs that we have to that we have to reach when we when we are budgeting our trade-offs between education, health and also the security, the security sector. Um, so maybe just to, to, to round off um, with a couple of maybe points that relate to 
um, what has already been said by, by, um, by Willine, and that is that there are constitutional um, provisions that provide very clear indications as to what oversight role is, 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 is performed and also when that oversight role is performed, right? Um, but I've always found, um, and it's something where I encourage my, my peers working in ministries of finance to also look for the informal ways in which you, the executive can engage with parliament where more information is provided than what is you know, required by the constitution or required by the rules. Um, so I always found it useful to keep parliament updated um, in terms of what's happening with the budget process. Where are we now in the budget process? What are some of the assumptions that are informing um, how much um, additional funds there may be? Um, what is it that the executive is emphasizing? Um, just so that you, you're able to um, engage with, 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 with the relevant committees, um, but also to help the relevant committees prepare when they now do need to exercise their, their constitutional mandate. Um, I, I fully agree with the point that has been made that there's, there's entry points in every phase of that budget cycle that we lean um, shared shared with us. Um, so, you know, inputs into budget formulation, um, inputs into in-year execution, and inputs especially into the expenditure outcomes, because parliaments do need to, uh, I mean, parliaments receive the Auditor General's um, reports, and where there's unauthorized expenditure, it is parliaments that have to take a decision as to whether the unauthorized expenditure is going to be authorized. Um, and, and by authorized and unauthorized expenditure, yeah, I'm referring to expenditure that has not been, that has not been voted on, right? So it's not authorized, but you have, you have spent. Um, I think it's, it's, it's also important to note that there's also only so much time to do all of this. So there are some overlapping um, activities that are taking place, um, but the more time the executive gets to prepare the budget, you do cut into the time that parliament gets to um, evaluate and approve the, the, the budget proposals. And the reverse is also true. I mean, if you're going to allow more time for, for parliament um, to consider um, the budget that is being tabled, um, the, the less time you're going to have for the executive to prepare the budget. And what you do want to try and achieve is to at least have the budget approved not too far into the start of a new financial year. Um, because then you start to impact on service delivery. Some legislation does allow for expenditure up to a certain percentage into a new financial year prior to the approval or enactment of the budget. And that's a useful, that's a useful provision within the law to have, to have that in place um, in, 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 the presidential system like we have in Nigeria, Liberia, and also in, in the US. I mean, if Congress cannot agree on, on, on the budget, then it does lead to a, a shutdown. Um, in the Westminster system, there is the provision to proceed with a new financial year, but spend up to a certain a certain percentage, which I think is is useful because it does allow parliaments to have slightly more time um, in, in, in evaluating the budget, the budget proposals. Um, I think that, um, you know, coming back to my story and I'll end, um, you know, in, in, in um, circling back to my story 
those reams and reams of dot matrix expenditure lines um, was when the country was still doing itemized budgeting. Um, and what I believe helped to level the playing field across all spending ministries, including the security sector, was the move towards program-based budgeting. Because now budgets did not look all that different, right? When you were not examining items in their gory detail, you were now looking at programs and those programs in health would be maternal health. In defense, it would be land-based forces. Um, and immediately they took on a meaning as to what, what money was being allocated for and what the objective of the program was. Um, so budgets suddenly started looking very similar in terms of the, in terms of the program structure, and then, you know, moving towards a standard economic classification also now helps to understand. So what is the personnel, but how much is the Defense Department spending on personnel? Um, what is the Department of Correctional Services spending on, on personnel? And likewise for education and, and health. Um, so maybe to just to just end end my my first intervention, and that is um, you know to make the point that um, that with the necessary and appropriate levels of of secrecy, the extent of oversight and scrutiny of the security sector should be no different to that of any other sector, and there are tools that help us get to that. Um, Pauline, you know, shared some, some examples of, of how that secrecy is, is, is um, 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 achieved. Um, and I have a, a couple of other um, examples that I can share. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Cole. Yes, that would be great. That's exactly where I wanted to go next with my second question. Um, you know, so what are some useful strategies that you have seen parliamentarians and budget professionals using to challenge what is often this culture of secrecy around the defense and security sector budget? If you could spend yeah. just a couple minutes on that, I think that would be great for, for those listening. Yeah. So we, so to maybe introduce the, my, my response by saying that where budgets are not examined and where oversight does not happen because of the need or a perceived need for secrecy, things almost always go wrong, right? Um, especially where there are these things called slush funds. Somebody is always going to exploit those. Um, and, and as we've had in, in South Africa, um, where things like crime intelligence, slush funds, um, uh, intelligence services, slush funds um, were in place and where there was not sufficient examination and oversight, um, it did lead to um, corruption and, and also led to situations where the very democracy was being was being undermined. Yeah. Um, so let, let's start with finance ministries and and what we had in place in 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 the national treasury to examine the budget of um, the defense, the military intelligence fund, um, the crime intelligence fund within the police, and also the. The, the, the budget of the secret service, right? I mean, just to use a more, a more general term, um, was to have um, officials um, who were appropriately vetted um, and, and, and it was the vetting that they got was at the highest level. Um, so it would be very similar vetting that would be given for an intelligence officer 
um, you know, that involved polygraph tests, um, interviews with family members, um, past acquaintances, et cetera, et cetera. So it was, it, it was a very rigorous process that was undertaken. And, and these were now the budget examiners that would be responsible for, um, well, having access to the budgets of those different um, the, those those different um, programs within each of the within within each of the departments in the security sector, um, and they would also be presented with um, any bids that were being made for additional resources, um, and and by being able to look at what was the baseline for each of those pro those programs. They could also make recommendations on um, where savings um, can be realized, especially where there's a need for realizing savings across the entire um, public public sector. And then within within parliaments, um, you know, you do have parliamentary committees um, that that exercise oversight over the budgets of these different funds that are located within within programs in the police within the defense um, force within the secret um, um, services um, that also undergo a similar vetting um, process um, and and that vetting process you know can needs to happen at frequent intervals um, just so that you ensure that you know people that on do have now access to information um, that if revealed could impact negatively on on state security or, or people um, that have subjected themselves to this very rigorous vetting vetting processes and and, and that's and that's important. Um, and there may be other mechanisms. I, I mean, I like some of the suggestions that that Willian shared shared with us, um, because the point here is that it it shouldn't be an excuse not to have this examination or to have that oversight. So, what are the steps that need to be taken in order to ensure that we do two things? We do the thorough examination of oversight, but we ensure that um, the secrecy that needs to be retained is, is, is retained. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, we have, um, I may spend, ask you to spend just a couple more minutes um, sharing a few closing thoughts with us before we move to the question and answer about um, communication with constituents. So you've talked about, and so has Dr. Willeen, how the budgeting process affects then the delivery of security services, justice services to citizens, I and mean, how we hope that produces results that the parliament can also help to oversee. Um, how can parliamentarians and staff then best communicate with their constituents about these linkages? Do you have any suggestions there? Maybe um, if I can shorten you, maybe just for two or three minutes so that we save some time for our Q&A, if possible. Yeah. Yeah. So thank you very much. And, and I think here yeah, the the different um, parliamentary systems um, come into play. Um, so, you know, I mean, in the case of Liberia and, and Nigeria, um, I mean, constituencies are, are what gets representatives into the legislature. Um, but then we also have examples of the Westminster system where you have, um, where primaries, um, where elections happen within primaries, um, where the constituency is also very powerful um, and maybe less so with the, the political party. Um, whereas in, in South Africa and, and, and in a couple of, our closer neighbors, um, the political party is what is um, probably more important than the constituency, right? So you, you vote for the political party, 
and the political party has a, a, a list of members and depending on the support that the political party gets in an election, that will determine how many members on that list gets into parliament. And then parliament, you know, appoints, elects the president, the president appoints um, how his cabinet. Um, parliamentarians in that system are then assigned the constituencies. Um, and the extent to which there is that accountability to the constituency is, is it has less of an impact as in the case where somebody is directly elected by a constituency um, to, to sit in, in the legislature. Um, but then I also find that, that often constituencies, the types of engagements that they have with their representatives is more about the things that matter to them the most. You know, so whether it is a new clinic that needs to be built in the constituency, that the school has been damaged by a flood and needs to be repaired or rebuilt, um, that there's a road that needs to be built or a bridge so that kids can cross the river to get to school or to the clinic. So it's the immediate things that constituencies engage with their, their, their representatives. Um, where there are regions or constituencies where there are security concerns, I mean, and one who would imagine that um, in, in some states in, in Nigeria, um, where, they, where they are security concerns um, posed by Boko Haram, that constituencies would want to engage with their representatives around whether there is sufficient investment in, 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 in defense um, and, 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 and related. Um, but it is about it is about the immediate and um, and and constituencies or representatives are are skilled at. Um, I mean, if they're good politicians, then they're skilled at picking up on what it is that most concerns their constituency, um, and I think that that engagement is is important. But maybe you know to make to make this point, and 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 I think it's a, it's it's maybe about pragmatism and and realism in terms of what really is taking place. That there is an engagement between constituencies and their representatives. The budget to that is then allocated and the effectiveness with which that, ballot, that budget is being spent on the building of a new school or a new role is, is sometimes delinked, right? Um, and that I think is also about issues of how the executive and the legislator are working together, holding each other, well, how the legislator is holding the executive to account and, and the extent to which the executive is providing the legislator with information on plans, budgets, and implementation, and how often audits are being conducted to, in, to determine whether the funds have been used for that new school or that clinic or that road. Um, and then the ability of a representative to go to their constituency and say, you see, that road that I promised was, there was a budget allocated for it and that road has now been built, right? Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Um, and, and that points to, you know, a degree of functionality. It points to a degree to which a constitution is working in terms of the executive, the legislator, and also the judiciary. Um, and, and just the overall capability of the state. Um, yeah. And, and, and yeah, I mean, I, I think, you know, it's something that we, that we all would want to strive for in, in, um, 
you know, building up these capable states that are able to achieve all of that. Thank you thank so you. much. Yeah, thank you. Thank you to both um, Willine and Neil for um, your comprehensive answers and for bringing up, we've seen how these different themes um, of the week have intertwined across your two um, presentations and um, we have some examples to build off of.